So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, the first speaker, uh, Dr. Caroline Edwards. Uh, I'm not going to go through your whole biography because that would <laughs> take us too long. Uh, so forgive me for, uh, for, for doing a short uh, introduction here. Dr. Caroline Edwards, who's a lecturer in modern and contemporary literature at Birkbeck University of London. She's co-edited uh, two books on living writers, completing a monograph entitled Fictions of the Not Yet. Um, she's also project director of the Open Access Publisher, which I think is a really exciting project. You know, we talked about it earlier on. Uh, the Open Access Publisher, Open Library of Humanities, and founding and commission editor of an open access journal of 21st century literature called Alluvium. Caroline, over to you. Um, what I'm going to do is um, take this opportunity to take you on a kind of whistle-stop tour of the literary utopia. Um, as has just been mentioned then in the introduction, this is a, um, a kind of form of political philosophy, if you like, um, a way of experimenting with different modes of government, different modes of social organisation. But there are kind of interesting um, aspects, formal um, aspects, literary properties contained within the utopia, as Thomas More um, uh, coined the term in uh, 1516. Am I allowed the clicker? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Taking control, right. Uh, let's see if that works. Okay. Oh, sorry, I should say before I start, this image is absolutely fantastic. Um, it's called uh, The Year 2000. It's from a series by French artists who are invited to imagine what future society would look like in 2000 in the late 1900s. Um, they were going to be on children's suites and the backs of cigarette packets, but as I understand it, they never actually <laughs> were published. So the utopian visions of you know, flying firemen of the future and the retrofuturism is, is fantastic. So um, thinking about the new world and this idea of um, the literary utopia and where it was born, I think it's really important to think that in this period, um, you know, the kind of English Renaissance, when Thomas More, friends with, uh, you know, no known figures like Erasmus, personal advisor to Henry VIII, when he came up with this idea of utopia, um, it's worth bearing in mind that this is a period of colonial modernity. This is the period in which countries like England and other European nations are going out on these seafaring voyages off to the New World. And therefore, the kind of imagination that you would travel across the Atlantic or Pacific Ocean and you would suddenly come across this hidden island, um, uh, you know, sort of shipwrecked and, and um, land on an island and discover a mysterious and exciting new society, was very much couched in a kind of realist framework. When Thomas More published Utopia in 1516, this is um, a couple of centuries and a half before we really have... Um, the birth of the literary novel as we understand it. So in terms of sort of formal properties, when you look at the book Utopia, not in the Utopian, because unfortunately I'm not fluent in Utopian, <laughs> but when you look at, at, at a version of it, it's framed and couched in these interesting ways. There are all these letters um, between Moore himself and Peter Giles and these other figures. And so it's very much presented as a kind of real voyage. This place really exists. And the key thing to remember is that... Um, Thomas More and every writer since Thomas More who's been writing about utopia is always very much rooted in the contemporary moment in which they're writing. The purpose of these books is to try and encourage the readership to reflect upon their own real world environment. So that kind of verisimilitude is, is kind of quite important. I thought I'd sketch out a few other um, very important literary utopias that followed More during the um, kind of Renaissance period. Uh, we have there Tom, uh, Tommaso Campanella's City of the Sun from 1602, uh, and has been mentioned Francis Bacon's um, The New Atlantis. Um, a, a nice image that I found of The New Atlantis, it's very much uh, a text that tries to imagine scientific inventions, what, what the natural sciences could develop into. It's very concerned with a sort of didactic um, form of education, and you've got there those two gentlemen in this woodcut uh, communicating with one another through a sort of primitive um, telephone kind of device. Um, one that I'd like to uh, reflect upon in a little bit more detail, actually, is Margaret Cavendish's The Blazing World from 1666. Margaret Cavendish was the Duchess of Newcastle, um, a highly educated and um, prolific woman. 
Uh, and she comes up with a kind of utopian text in which a young woman is walking along the seashore and is basically kidnapped by a bunch of lascivious sailors. And so she's taken onto their ship and she's a great risk. And it's a sort of very threatening, seafaring kind of travelogue tale. Uh, and then as they get closer to the North Pole, all of the sailors suddenly freeze to death and this woman miraculously mm. survives. And she traverses through the North Pole um, into this utopian um, kind of kingdom where she eventually becomes um, a, a sort of empress. And it's very interesting for many reasons. It combines that kind of philosophical discourse that is uh, integral to these, to these utopian texts. It's very much a text in which she's discoursing the scientific um, innovations of the day and she wants to learn how this, um, the, the kingdom of the blazing world has developed uh, compared with her own home back in England. But at the same time, it's obviously a fantasy. It's a fantasy journey. It's a voyage replete with fishmen and bear men and, and all kinds of animalised subjects that she comes to um, rule. And, of course, for those of us who might be interested in gender and rethinking the literary canon uh, from the perspective of overlooked women writers, I think Margaret Cavendish is a fantastic example. She's somebody that Virginia Woolf um, was very interested in writing about as well. So what we have in these early modern and, and Renaissance utopias then, we have this kind of meditation on the ideal commonwealth, particularly with reference to the classical world, to um, Aristotle's poetics, to Plato's Republic. We also have explicit meditations on the politics of the age in which these texts were written. So in Thomas More's case, this is Tudor England, and he has some fantastic things to say in his text um, for example, about um, Ralph, uh, Raphael, sorry, Hitler Day, the, the utopian traveller who's shown around um, the New World, uh, has a great discourse on the abolition of private property, which seems surprisingly contemporary reading it now, um, and, and talking about the social ills of greedy landowners and, um, and poverty in London and class inequality. But then, of course, more plays with that in a very kind of playful, ludic sort of way, by couching that, and at the end, the figure more comes back and says, but of course, this is ridiculous. We couldn't possibly have a society without money and without property. However, there are some good points about this Commonwealth. So you can already see the complexity, the layers in which these stories are told. They have a very serious message for their readership, but at the same time, they're aware that the, the, the adjective utopian is a pejorative. It's used to refer to something that is unrealisable and fantastic. And that brings me neatly then, sort of the next stop on our whistle-stop tour really is the mid-19th century uh, and some of these um, utopian socialists that we've heard a little bit about. The image here that you can see is the Welsh industrialist Robert Owen who um, bought a religious commune um, in Indiana in 1825 and it became Harmony and then subsequently New Harmony. Um, and, and so this is the great industrial age in which some of these industrialists consider their factory as an environment for, for experimentation, as a kind of social laboratory. So they're training up their workers in different ways. Um, New Lanark is another very good example up in Scotland, in Lanarkshire. They're thinking about how children should be educated as well as working in the factory, how the workers should be able to have music lessons and dance and artistic engagement and so on. And these people um, were noticed by Marx and Engels, who very famously wrote about this idea of kind of utopian socialism. Um, of course, Marx and Engels then, trying to lead a communist revolution through the mid-19th century, were quite careful to differentiate their socialist, their scientific form of socialism from utopian socialism. So again, you see this tension between what is actually possible in political um, development or experimentation and what is just a fantasy world that's sort of held up as, um, as an inverse of our own world to show us our failings as something we might aim for, but is it, as you suggest, desirable for us to try and reach that? So there's this question of empirical validity. Socialism then is trying to suggest that it's uh, grounded in real life, in industrial labour, organisation, working class struggle, trying to move towards a non-alienated form of, of life in communism. But arguably communism itself is a very utopian project. 
Um, I'm going to couch all of the 20th century communist projects as, as, as to whether those are definitely communist or not. But certainly at the time of Marx and Engels, the communist society had not yet happened. And so they're having to use this kind of speculative register to imagine what life might be like outside of capitalism. And that requires a great kind of um, leap of imagination, if you like. Okay, so moving on then. Something really interesting happens in the late 19th century. This is the next period that anybody interested in the evolution of the literary utopia absolutely has to go back to and, and have a look at. And what happens is there's a shift from um, utopia being um, an elsewhere in space, in cartography, right? Remember those um, new voyages to the New World, travelling off towards America or off towards Australasia and finding these utopian islands somewhere in these new societies. It shifts from being about space and cartography and geography and it becomes about time. The idea of a euchronia, that utopia, that the utopian society is somewhere in the future or in another time or a parallel time. It goes from being an elsewhere to an else when. And if you start to think about this, this is absolutely no surprise. We've got industrialization happening, which means a standardization of global time um, according to um, you know, the Greenwich Mean Time, for example. It's a time in which workers are processed through these large-scale factories as the kind of hegemonic form of work at, in the late 19th century. They're, they're, they're living by what we would now call a clock time. And so if you think of a film, for example, like Fritz Lang's Metropolis and that image of the clock that the workers are desperately trying to control the clock, the clock comes to symbol, the timepiece comes to symbolise a repressive form of social life whereby we're all governed and dominated by this very mechanised um, kind of um, rapacious um, sort of machinic environment in which we have to produce um, because that's where we work. And so at this time then we get a flourishing of literary utopias, uh, particularly in North America, also in, in Britain, in Australia, New Zealand. Um, a variety not just then of social experiments, but also experiments in, in literary form. Uh, I've picked out three here for you that I think are particularly um, pertinent to our discussion. The first of which then is Edward Bellamy's bestseller, Looking Backward, um, which classically has um, the visitor going off into the future uh, and being guided around this sort of futuristic world. Um, I, we should note that Bellamy's text was so popular in North America that it spawned hundreds of Bellamy societies um, where people would be campaigning at a local level for, for trying to think of a more socially oriented and utopian kind of politics. So it's hard to think now, but it was enormously influential at the time, really the bestseller of its day. Um, another good example, then, um, that we have here would be William Morris's uh, News from Nowhere, published in 1890. Um, again, uh, a euchronia. So William Guest, the protagonist, wakes up one day in the future, in the distant future in London, um, and in this sort of um, Ar Arcadian, slightly neo-feudal pastoral version of the future, which um, Wells was particularly interested, because, of course, Wells um, had that interest in craftsmanship, in a kind of pre-capitalist form of labour and production and artisanal work. So William Guest wakes up and the great smelting factories, the polluted industrial centres in the Midlands, Manchester, Liverpool, elsewhere, have been obliterated. <laughs> Nature has kind of taken over. And he's in a sort of post-revolutionary communist society in the future. Industrialisation has been reversed. And you get several of the classic tropes of the utopian novel, which is to say you get a slightly schematic discourse. These are very discursive novels. They're very much about two people or three people talking with one another and um, discussing how can we do education better, what would gender relations be like in this future, do people marry or not, how can we live with one another. And in um, William Morris's future, people live in these kind of collective commune style um, um, sort of medieval um, barns, effectively, um, and they wear medieval dress. So in terms of style, it's, it's quite a fun one um, to go back and, and read. And right at the end of the novel, William Guest says to the reader directly, I think this is really important, he says, go back and be the happier... Um, sorry, he is told by the, the utopian um, inhabitants, go back and be the happier for having seen us, for having added a little hope to your struggle. <laughs> 
And Guest reflects on this and says, yes, surely. And if others can see it as I have seen it, then it may be called a vision rather than a dream. So again, think about that tension between something that is fantastic and dreamlike and futuristic and something which is supposed to empower us in the here and now. Uh, William Morris, um, like H.G. Wells and others in, in sort of Hammersmith and West London, were very, um, very much a part of the sort of socialist politics and discourse of their day. And then another classic, um, this is just drifting now into the early decade of the 20th century, is Charlotte Perkins' Gil Gilman's Herland, a fantastic text. Um, Gilman is a very interesting figure. She self-published, it's kind of vanity publishing if you like, um, a serialised story about a utopia, um, a society just of women where men have... Um, disappeared in history and women have found a way to miraculously reproduce without having any men, it's a kind of form of miraculous conception. Uh, and what happened was, although um, in, in the forerunner in her journal at the time this was quite well known, the text disappeared and it dropped out of literary history and no one talked about it until 1979 during the feminist movement when feminist uh, critics and editors effectively recovered this text put it together, so the version we have, the contemporary version, is an edited version, and there are various sort of less salubrious aspects, like eugenics, which have been toned down a little in the edited version. And so as a part of the 70s feminist movement, then, Gilman becomes revived. It's a very interesting text. It's, all of these texts are very much in dialogue, not just explicitly with Moore's Utopia, but in Gilman's text, um, she's also very much engaged with Bellamy's novel, Looking Backwards, and she herself had been one of these Bellamyites. She'd been working in the nationalist movement in California. Um, fantastic for many reasons. The women there are very athletic and very strong and competent. Um, the, the young men who encounter this society are very impressed by their agricultural sophistication, by their techniques and so on. It's unambiguously Edenic. They have effectively turned their small state into a kind of garden. It's very productive. It yields a lot of fruit. Again, we have the abolition of private property. People can just live in one house or another house. They can travel for work. It doesn't really matter. Um, there's also a, a reflection upon the way in which children are raised and women who are deemed perhaps not best suited to motherhood are allowed to have children but are helped in how they bring up those children because the children are kind of collectively raised according to a sort of feminist, pantheist, religious kind of sacred society. So there are clearly really important issues that um, Charlotte Perkins Gilman is trying to address and I suppose perhaps the most important for us is the way in which the young uh, contemporary American men reflect upon these women. They think they're going to turn up in this kind of Arcadia of sexy young girls and they can just kind of party with them and have fun. And it's nothing like that. Um, when they first arrive and they're sort of manhandled, they said, you know, we're in the position of the suffragettes being sort of taken by the police and edged off. So there's a really interesting kind of role reversal and a reflection on the way in which sort of feminine charms, the way in which women wear great big bonnets and fancy dresses and have to be very um, engaging with their male companions is something that the Herlanders don't need to do. There aren't any men to please. And so the women are liberated to be kind of strong uh, and forge this new society. So um, another moment that I would suggest now, well into um, the 20th century then, that is really interesting for those of us who work on literary utopias, would be the early Russian revolutionary period, between about 1905 and shortly after the early years of 1917 with the Russian Revolution. Um, the poster here, as you can see, is from A Journey to Mars. And any of you who are familiar with kind of Soviet propaganda posters with early silent cinema of this time, um, Eisenstein and so on, you'll, you'll be very aware of this grand sense of the future. This is a future in which scientific innovation matches design and kind of avant-garde styles, uh, collage posters, um, juxtaposition in filmmaking, for example, where... Um, you have the kind of cross-cutting between images that jars the audience into thinking about what they're watching. It's a really kind of interesting period, and a period in which early uh, ideas about space travel 
are very uh, influential. And so you get a number of novels that deal with um, travelling to Mars, which is absolutely fantastic. And what they imagine is how the Martian... Um, it, I mean, they're always a communist or socialist kind of Martian uh, population could help us back on Earth, and specifically in places like St. Petersburg or back in Russia, could help us to kind of reflect upon their own revolution and, and the politics of the time. In terms of historical context, this is um, a very rapidly changing environment. You've got electrification, the Great Siberian Railroad, new developments in aeronautics, in aviation. And so these give birth to early Russian um, science fiction texts in which you have these kind of heroic cosmonaut figures. So you have these engineers. They're, ex they're always scientists who are protagonists of these texts. Um, and there was a huge public appetite for this kind of material, for illustrated magazines that were showing astronomical photographs, developments in the telescope and photography and so on. Two that are um, definitely worth your time, I would say, Alexander Bogdanov's Red Star, um, uh, again, a superior Martian culture, which um, has, has had a much more successful socialist revolution than we were experiencing back on Earth at the time after the 1905 revolution. And also Tolstoy's Elita, from which Elita, Queen of Mars, uh, quite a well-known early Soviet film, was um, adapted. And so what happens then, after this sort of brief moment um, in, in the sort of Bolshevik utopian imaginary, is that across Europe it leads into um, a, a period of dystopia, um, an imagination of totalitarian regimes, whether they're communist, whether they're fascist. Through the 1930s and 40s we get a huge number of um, texts reacting against the rise of Nazism. And so at this time in Europe's history, it seems very unlikely that utopia is even possible. And therefore, a number of dystopias become, sorry, dystopias become um, published. Yevgeny Zamyatin's uh, We from 1924, a very interesting example of one. But I would um, suggest that actually um, We is, is as critical about the capitalist future as it is about the totalitarian or, or state-led collective future. And so they're, but they're still very rich texts today. OK, moving towards the end of the 20th century then, what happens is in the late 1960s and early 1970s, um, actually, utopia becomes back on the agenda, and this is in large part due to the fact that we've had various social movements, um, including feminism, a new kind of ecological awareness, and the um, kind of uh, growing prevalence, perhaps, of the political new left, people thinking about left-wing ideas. And so in this period, utopias become more complicated, as we can see in texts such as Joanna Russ's The Female Man. Um, you might have a utopian community within these novels, but it's framed around often quite dystopian reflections on whether it's possible or not to live in that utopia, or whether that utopia is entirely imagined. Um, Marge Piercy's Woman on the Edge of Time, for example, the utopia in that novel is travelled to by the protagonist via a slightly psychotropic form of kind of telepathy, um, and she's in a mental asylum. So you can read the novel as they manage to travel you know, in, into some sort of distant future just through the power of their mind, or you can suggest that this is a response to a very difficult situation where she's locked up in jail as a result of structural oppression because um, she's a Chicana woman, she's Hispanic, she's been put in there by her abusive um, uh, brother-in-law and so on. So interesting engagements. Um, this, this isn't an image of the novel, but I think it quite accurately reflects what happens in the novel. These utopias, which seem very contemporary now, are all about slightly hippie ideas of growing vegetables, biodomes, um, sort of uh, de-industrialising and decentralising the way in which we produce energy and the way in which we produce our own food and so on. And so that brings me really to my conclusion. What's happened to utopian texts in the 21st century? This is something I spent quite a long time thinking about and I don't necessarily have a clear answer for you. But one thing that I would say is that there is, as you may well be aware, um, a number of contemporary writers who are very preoccupied with um, questions of apocalypse, questions of eco-catastrophe, questions of the end of the world. And there are obviously very clear reasons why we should reflect on these issues. They're very pressing for our own time. Now, whilst on the surface that might not sound very utopian, I would actually suggest that um, utopia and apocalypse have a long-standing connection in philosophical terms. If you understand apocalypse 
uh, according to its sort of Greek translation, as a process of unveiling, of sort of lifting the veil off something, seeing things clearly for the first time. Of course, in um, you know, Christian and Judaic terms, it's, con it's associated with a new beginning, the new Jerusalem, which is an apocalyptic vision that John of Patmos um, imagines seeing. Then it, it might not surprise you to realise that texts about the apocalypse, um, a fantastic example here would be... Uh, I have some quotations from Emily St. John Mandel's um, uh, Station Eleven. A, a, a post-apocalyptic narrative in which a global viral pandemic has destroyed most of the world's population and people are living a kind of pre-industrial life. They, they go around you know, on carts drawn by horses, they don't have electricity and so on. But nonetheless, as you can see from some of the quotes I picked out, there was still such beauty. After everything that was lost in the collapse, almost everything, almost everyone, there is still such beauty. And it's really striking, this novel published two years ago is just suffused with um, this incredible sense of the beauty of the natural landscape. And it really leads us to question, what is our role as humanity? <laughs> as sort of, we're not really guardians or stewards of the landscape anymore because there's an Arcadian revenge taking place and nature manages to take back control of the natural environment. But I would suggest there is still um, the utopian kind of impulse, the sense of utopian possibility um, understood as reflecting on our own world and our cap late capitalist world and how we might think about changing that is very much alive and kicking in these texts, just perhaps in a slightly reformulated way from Thomas More's early um, ideal commonwealth. Thank you very much.